When Rock Hill, South Carolina police arrived at Billy Wayne Cope's home on November 29, 2001, they found his 12-year-old daughter Amanda murdered and raped in her own bed. With no evidence of an intruder, Cope became the primary suspect. He confessed to the murder, was convicted by a jury, and sentenced to life in prison. On the night of November 29, 2001, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, a sense of unease jolted Billy Cope awake around 3 a.m. He immediately noticed something amiss. The hallway light, which he distinctly remembered switching off before bed, was now on. With his wife, Mary Sue, working her overnight office cleaning job, Billy was home alone with his three daughters, Amanda, 12, Jessica, 11, and Kyla, seven. The family, deeply Christian, had skipped their usual Wednesday church service to help Jessica with her challenging math homework. Amanda, ever the supportive older sister, had stepped in to assist Jessica, and Billy had allowed the girls to stay up until the work was completed. Meanwhile, Kyla had retired to bed at 9 p.m. After a late night helping his daughters with their schoolwork, Billy, who used a CPAP machine for his sleep apnea, had eventually headed to bed around 1 a.m., looking forward to some well-deserved rest. Yet, only two hours later, something unknown woke him. Groggy but concerned, Billy went to check on his daughters. Finding Amanda's door closed, he assumed she might have gotten up for water, causing the light to be on. Peeking into the other bedroom, he saw Jessica and Kyla sleeping peacefully. Reassured but still puzzled, Billy returned to his room, restarted his CPAP machine and drifted back into sleep unaware of the unfolding events in his home. On the morning of November 29, 2001, at 6 a.m., Billy Cope's sleep was abruptly ended by his alarm clock. He later recounted that his brief hours of sleep were filled with a vivid and unsettling dream about the rapture a belief in which Jesus returns for his followers. In this dream, he saw his eldest daughter Amanda ascending, leaving him behind with her parting words, Bye, Daddy. This intense vision left Billy feeling disconcerted as he rose from his bed to check on his daughters. His anxiety was momentarily eased when he found his younger daughters, Jessica and Kyla, sleeping soundly. However, this sense of relief quickly evaporated when he reached Amanda's room. Struggling to open her door, which was obstructed by an open closet door, a heart-wrenching scene awaited him. Amanda lay motionless on her bed, and upon touching her, Billy realized the chilling truth. She was ice cold, confirming the worst fears sparked by his nightmare. In a state of shock, he gently covered her and frantically called 911. Despite the rapid response of paramedics from the fire department, it was too late. Their life-saving equipment could not change the tragic reality. Amanda was no longer alive. This devastating discovery marked the beginning of a harrowing ordeal for Billy and his family. Is she breathing? Oh, no, she's dead. Uh, she's cold as a cucumber. And 
Okay, you don't want to try to CPR or anything on her? No, ma'am, she's dead. I mean, she, her, her mouth is completely shut. She's ice cold. Okay, when was the last time you saw her alive, sir? About uh, 2 o'clock this morning. About 2 o'clock this morning? Has she one, been... 1 o'clock this morning. Has she been sick or anything? No, ma'am. The, the thing was just wrapped around her neck. Was it her bed clothing or her sheet? It was her blanket. She just had a blanket laying there and it come unless she rolled over and it wrapped around her neck. It's a the green thing on the blanket. She laid on the green blanket with a green blanket. And it had a string wrapped around it. I mean uh, uh, the you know the the, 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 the the I gotta call my wife. Okay. Okay, what kind of house do you live in, sir? Mm -hmm. What color's your house? It's white, but she's gone on to be with the Lord because she was a Christian. Please, I, I really Okay. All right, sir. I have my light on. All right, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and bye-bye. On that fateful day, Jason Dillon from the Rock Hill Fire Department approached Billy Cope to inquire about the circumstances of his daughter Amanda's death. Billy, bewildered, speculated she might have accidentally choked on her blanket during sleep as she had a tendency to toss and turn. Shortly after, detectives arrived promptly declaring the residence an active crime scene and launching an investigation. The detectives were instantly struck by Billy's response to the tragedy. His composed manner and lack of visible emotion raised suspicions. As the investigation intensified, the small house was swarmed with investigators combing for clues. They were met with a disordered environment. The family's possessions cluttered every corner, clothes were strewn about, dishes piled up in the sink, and cockroaches scuttled away into hiding. Amidst this chaos, Amanda's body was found on her bed, fully clothed, surrounded by her books and recent school photographs. A detailed examination of the body revealed a horrifying truth. She had been brutally beaten, strangled and assaulted. Bruises marked her body and critical physical evidence was discovered on her clothes, which was promptly collected for analysis. An additional perplexing discovery was made during the home inspection. All doors and windows showed no signs of forced entry being locked from the inside, suggesting the perpetrator might have been someone within the household. When detectives questioned Billy about his theory of Amanda's death, his explanation of accidental strangulation by a blanket starkly contradicted the crime scene evidence. Further investigation into Billy's past unearthed unsettling details. Two years earlier, he and his wife had pleaded guilty to neglecting their children's care. This revelation, combined with his unusual reaction, improbable explanation of Amanda's death and the lack of forced entry, led police to view Billy as the prime suspect. Convinced of the need for a more thorough interrogation, authorities promptly escorted Billy to the police station for an in-depth questioning, delving deeper into the tragic and mysterious circumstances surrounding Amanda's untimely demise. In the days following the tragic murder of Amanda, her father Billy Cope was subjected to an exhaustive and intense series of interrogations by detectives. Over a span of four grueling days, he endured more than 17 hours of relentless questioning. The first day alone, coinciding with the date of the murder, November 29, 2001, saw Billy in the interrogation room for three and a half hours. The detectives were convinced of Billy's guilt right from the outset of this initial questioning. 
Their primary goal was to elicit a confession from him. Despite their certainty, Billy consistently maintained his innocence, reiterating it over 650 times. He passionately told the officers about his love for his daughters, asserting that he could never harm Amanda. He attributed his unawareness during the incident to the loud noise of his sleep apnea machine, which drowned out other sounds. This explanation, however, appeared implausible to the investigators who pressed on in their quest for a confession. The interrogation tactics grew more intense, with detectives attempting to leverage Billy's faith against him, warning him of eternal damnation for his supposed sins. They also hinted at the looming threat of incriminating physical evidence. Despite these strategies, Billy remained steadfast in his denial of any involvement in his daughter's murder. On the second day, as the fourth hour of questioning approached, Billy, desperate to prove his innocence, requested a polygraph test. He believed this would unequivocally demonstrate his truthfulness. However, this decision marked a pivotal moment in the interrogation. The polygraph administrator abruptly halted the test, slamming his hand on the table and declaring to the detectives that Billy had failed. Devastated by this result, Billy's composure began to crumble. Under renewed and intensified pressure from the detectives, Billy's resolve wavered. Gradually, he started to speak, leading to a series of confessions, each more uncertain than the last. The first confession concluded with Billy signing a written statement admitting to the murder. However, as the interrogation continued over the following days, Billy gave a total of four different confessions, each conflicting with the others and the crime scene evidence. One confession bizarrely included Amanda being beaten with a broom, a detail absent from the others. The content of a dream varied across statements or was entirely omitted. Despite the glaring inconsistencies and signs of Billy's mental distress, detectives accepted his confessions as factual. The final confession involved a video reenactment at Billy's house, where he was recorded detailing his actions on the night of the murder. Following these multiple confessions, Billy was charged as the sole perpetrator of his daughter's murder. However, in a dramatic turn of events, Billy retracted all his confessions and proclaimed his innocence in court. Nevertheless, the damage was done. Billy was sent to prison without the possibility of bail or bond. The case, seemingly resolved, left an indelible mark on all involved, clouded by the complexities and controversies of the interrogation and confession process. A year after the tragic murder of Amanda Cope, her father Billy, who had initially confessed to the crime, began to proclaim his innocence. The community, including those who knew Billy, harbored strong convictions of his guilt. However, Billy's newly appointed private attorney from Rock Hill, Phil Beatty, was tasked with defending him in court. Initially convinced of Billy's guilt, Beatty aimed to secure a plea deal. Beatty's perspective shifted after learning about Billy's interrogation process. He was disturbed to discover that Billy's court-assigned public defender, B.J. Barrowclough, was initially denied access to him. 
The police claimed Billy had signed a note refusing to see his attorney, a claim met with skepticism by Barrow Clough. Billy's eventual confession came under intense pressure, with him claiming he was coerced by threats of the death penalty. Beatty, appalled by the apparent violation of Billy's rights, doubted the usefulness of this information given the signed confessions. In a startling development in late 2002, Beatty received a call from the prosecutor's office, expecting a plea deal discussion. Instead, he was informed that DNA evidence from Amanda's body did not match Billy's. This revelation indicated Billy's innocence, offering hope for his case. However, Beatty learned that the police had withheld this crucial information for over a year deepening his outrage over the gross miscarriage of justice. The DNA matched James Sanders, a career criminal and recent neighbor to the Copes, living just two blocks away. Sanders had a string of criminal activities, contrasting starkly with Billy, who was described as a socially isolated, devout Christian and aspiring preacher. Following Amanda's murder, Sanders committed several more sexual assaults in the neighborhood. This new evidence pointed to Billy's factual innocence. Beatty and his team questioned Billy about the false confessions he had given. Billy explained that his state of shock and attempt to confuse the police led to the inconsistent confessions. He had assumed the evidence would not corroborate his confessions. Despite Sanders being identified as the perpetrator, Billy remained charged with the crime, leading to further legal battles and the unraveling of a complex and tragic case. The 2004 trial of the Amanda Cope murder case was a battleground for contrasting narratives. Billy Cope's defense team steadfastly maintained his innocence, while the prosecution proposed a theory reconciling Billy's confessions with the newly discovered DNA evidence. They suggested a collaborative crime between Billy and James Sanders, explaining the lack of forced entry by alleging Billy had allowed Sanders into the house. The defense countered, accusing the prosecution of twisting the evidence to mask their own mishandling of the interrogation. They argued that Billy, suffering from mental health issues and reeling from the loss of his daughter, was coerced into confessing to a crime he didn't commit. However, crucial defense evidence was barred by Judge John C. Hayes III including the pattern of Sanders' subsequent sexual assaults, which also showed no signs of forced entry, hinting at his skill in breaking and entering without leaving traces. Additionally, a jailhouse informant's testimony, claiming Sanders had confessed to raping and killing a young girl in Rock Hill, was disallowed. This type of testimony often permitted when beneficial to the prosecution, was excluded in Billy's defense. Despite what might seem like a clear indication of Billy's non-involvement, the jury's verdict didn't align with this view. Both Sanders and Billy were found guilty of conspiracy and sentenced to life imprisonment without parole in 2004. In a twist, the South Carolina Court of Appeals overturned the conspiracy conviction in 2009, citing a lack of evidence linking Cope and Sanders. However, this decision was later reversed by the state Supreme Court, and the US Supreme Court declined to review the case. 
Billy Cope's story ended tragically behind bars. He passed away on February 9, 2017, at the age of 53, due to natural causes while still in state custody, never experiencing freedom after his daughter's murder charge. The case leaves many questions unanswered, and the true extent of Billy's involvement, if any, remains a matter of debate. The murder of Amanda Cope and the subsequent legal ordeal of her father, Billy, is a tale mired in tragedy and controversy, inviting us to ponder the complexities of justice and truth. <laughs>